According to the Chinese Zodiac, 2024 is the year of the dragon, but you would think it was the year of the monkey with all this hype around primates lately. There was that Monkey Man movie that released back in April, the very next month came the Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, and I know apes are different than monkeys, but I think I saw a monkey sneak into the background of one scene. But what has to be the most hyped primate project just dropped last week. Black Myth Wukong, a game inspired by the most famous story in all of Chinese mythology, Journey to the West. Actually, Black Myth Wukong might be playing second fiddle to Bad Monkey starring Vince Vaughn. It seems like that's all people are talking about lately. Bad Monkey this, Bad Monkey that. I ask them, Sun Wukong? And they're like, I'm pretty sure that's Vince Vaughn. Now, Black Myth Wukong is nowhere near the first time Journey to the West has been adapted into a different medium. Since the story's original publication in 1592, there have been dozens upon dozens of reimaginings and references to the Monkey Pilgrim in movies, TV shows, comics, and even other video games. Way too many for me to talk about, so today I want to focus on some of the most recent. Black Myth Wukong, of course, but also the surprisingly adept animated movie movie that dropped on Netflix last year, appropriately titled The Monkey King. And what's really interesting about each of these adaptations is they focus on completely different parts of Sun Wukong's story. The first part, about his miraculous birth, training, and powerful magic in pursuit of immortality is the sole focus of the Netflix movie. Black Myth Wukong touches on this too, providing context for the journey the game's protagonist is undertaking, but said journey is largely inspired by the second half of Sun Wukong's story, where the Buddha himself appointed the Monkey King to be the bodyguard of a monk named Tripitaka on his journey to retrieve ancient Buddhist scriptures that could bring China virtue and enlightenment. Neither of these are perfect adaptations, nor were they ever meant to be, but as a fan of all things mythology, I can't help but appreciate the clever ways they use the original story to tell their own especially the messed up parts. Yeah, if I haven't mentioned it already, Journey to the West is a story for all ages, but there are some parents out there who would not appreciate some of the monkey's hijinks. Those parents are mostly four-cornered equilaterals and the same ones who had banned their kids from reading Harry Potter because it promoted witchcraft, but if Harry Potter had to make a potion of period blood, breast milk, and his own urine, or if there was a chapter in the Chamber of Secrets where Ron's in a hot tub full of prostitutes, then maybe those parents would have a point. There is no shortage of monkey-induced morbidity for us to explore, compare, and contrast this episode, so I just want to jump into it. We're going to dive right into the Journey to the West story, because it's a long one. Way too long for me to tell in one video. The English translation comes out to something like, 1300 pages and I want to retire someday. So instead, I'm going to give you a hyper abridged version where I focus on the big picture parts of Sun Wukong's story while pointing out its similarities and differences with the Monkey King movie and Black Myth Wukong. This week, we're going to focus on the first act, which is basically a standalone story that covers the glorious rise and epic fall of the Monkey King. And in part two, we'll dive into how his journey inspired the coolest and cheapest bosses in Black Myth Wukong along with the mythology and history that inspired the original story, Journey to the West. I also want to give a special thank you to our resident folklorist and monster expert, Jack Daly, for helping research this episode. He put in a ton of hours scouring for information and then dumbing it down so even I could understand it. He also makes folklore content of his own on TikTok. Have you ever noticed how similar UFO reports are to traditional fairy lore? So consider following him if you want to learn more about folklore and myth from a real folklorist. Link at the bottom of the description. So, who exactly is Sun Wukong? Well, the movie answers this surprisingly well. Long, long ago, there was a stone that sat on top of a mountain called Flower Fruit Mountain. For centuries, the stone was nourished by the sun and moon, the earth and heaven, until one day it split open and freed the stone monkey, who wasted no time getting the attention of the gods, for two beams of golden light shone from his eyes and were visible all the way in heaven by the Jade Emperor himself. The movie's Jade Emperor describes himself as the creator of the universe and lord of the immortals, but that's an oversimplification. It was actually Panku, a hairy, horny giant who separated yin from yang, 
thing and created the Earth and Sky to keep them apart. I believe the Jade Emperor was there to witness all this, but his major contribution was making humans from clay. After Stone Monkey is born and gets control of his faculties, he moves in with a nearby troop of monkeys, which we see in the movie. Then, after he's the only one brave enough to pass through a nearby waterfall and discovers an expansive cave for the monkeys to make their new home, he's promoted to their leader and earns the title Monkey King. But after reigning over their society for hundreds of years, Monkey has a depressing realization. One day, he and all the other monkeys are going to die and be at the mercy of King Yama of the the underworld. Monkey King just couldn't accept that, so he leaves his society to learn the many teachings of Taoism from a monk named Subodhi, and this takes many years. By the end, though, he learned the secret of immortality and gained the majority of his now iconic powers. He learned how to shapeshift, how to travel thousands of miles a minute by hopping on clouds, and how to transform a single strand of his hair into a full-fledged clone of himself. These are the same powers that we get to use as Sun Wukong and as the Destined One in Black Myth Wukong. Only instead of gaining these abilities from a single monk, you learn them from various lovable weirdos from across the levels. Some of my favorites have been the Cloud Step, where you turn invisible and leave a clone in your place, and immobilize, because who doesn't love unloading a long day's worth of frustration on a helpless demon frozen in time? But I can't move on without mentioning the transformations. The game lets you transform into your enemies by collecting their spirits, and not just the weak little peons either, even the big bad bosses that no one's allowed to pee on. Back to the story, after 20 years of training, the Monkey King, now rocking the moniker Sun Wukong, meaning Monkey Awakened to emptiness, returned to his kingdom only to learn that in his absence, a demon moved into their cave and has been eating his loyal subjects. So he uses his newfound powers to battle with the monstrous king of chaos and cleaves his head down the middle. The movie doesn't get quite as bloody, but their version of these events is more or less accurate. It's just condensed them for time. The monkey does some training on his own and tries to face the demon, but learns that his physical abilities will be no match for it so he finds himself a new weapon and home runs the demon to the heavens. This is the courageous act that earns his monkey friends their home under the waterfall and monkey's place on the throne. As you may have inferred, Monkey King doesn't have that signature weapon at this point in the myth, but he vanquishes the demon anyway. Then, he builds up his monkey army by stealing weapons from the armory of a nearby kingdom, and is even able to recruit the other demon kings on the mountain to join his ranks. Probably because they don't want to end up like the last guy. It's not until after his army's been built, and he's been sitting on the throne for a while, that Monkey King decides he needs a weapon worthy of his immortality and the monkey elders direct him to the palace of the Dragon King, who lives at the bottom of the Eastern Ocean. Now in the story, Monkey King goes to the Dragon King's palace and uses his powers to intimidate the king into giving him the legendary magic iron that Emperor Yu the Great used to fix the floods in China. But in the movie, it's a pillar in the Dragon King's palace, and for some reason, it was necessary for his plot to conquer the land lovers. More on that later. The story monkey also gets some pretty sweet armor from the Dragon King and his three brothers, cloud-hopping lotus-colored silk shoes, golden chain mail, and a purple-gold phoenix-feathered cap. The game went with a very different approach to the Monkey King's look, at least in terms of the color scheme. But his armor and headgear is consistent with how artists have portrayed Sun Wukong for decades, if not centuries. Although I do like that the Destined One wears part of a tiger hide, because I believe this is a reference to the makeshift outfit he wears at the start of his journey with Tripitaka. Now the thing about Monkey King's staff is that it's a teensy bit overpowered. This thing can do whatever Sun Wukong wants, from changing its size so it reaches all all the way to heaven to shrinking down to the size of a needle so we can store it in his ear. Something we also see in the game and can even utilize with the pillar and thrust attack stances. Even cooler, the staff follows orders, so if Monkey King wants it to chase down an enemy or do a sweet spin move, it can. Now the movie also focuses a lot on Monkey King's conflict with the Dragon King and the dragon's attempts to steal his staff so he can go back to his original plan of conquering the world. And while this is a common occurrence, 
concurrence with the fiends and demons Monkey faces on his journey west, there's no such conflict with the Dragon King specifically. This is a complete departure from the source material, and so is the little girl sidekick. They do get one detail right though, and it's probably not what you would expect. After the movie's monkey steals the staff, the Dragon King files a formal complaint with the heavens and asks the Jade Emperor to intervene. This actually happens in the original story too, and that complaint is but a small stone in the avalanche that will bury the Monkey King. Before we dive into his epic fall though, I want to say thanks to my friend Dave for sponsoring this episode. Dave is the banking app that is leveling the financial playing field for us regular folks who don't appreciate the predatory practices of big banks. Because we all need a little financial help sometimes, whether you're at that awkward stage between paychecks or just got hit with some surprise fees from an overpriced membership that you swear you canceled last month. But what makes Dave so great? When you download Dave, you could receive up to $500 in five minutes or less. No credit checks, no late fees, and it's all possible thanks to Dave's extra cash account. Advance the money you need with no interest. That means when you need some cash for groceries, your gas tank, dog food, or electricity bill, Dave has you covered. And they won't make you regret asking for help. So if you want to try out a banking app that makes managing your finances easier and far less stressful, download Dave today at Dave.com slash John Solo. You could get up to $500 in five minutes or less when you download Dave. No credit checks, no late fees. Just download the app now or go to Dave.com slash John Solo. For terms and conditions, go to Dave.com slash legal. Eligibility criteria and instant transfer fees apply. Banking services provided by Evolve. Member FDIC. This is the part of the story where the Monkey King descends into the pits of hell. But that doesn't have anything to do with his downfall. Nah, he just went there to cross his name off the register of births and deaths to really lock in his immortality, which was a lot easier than you'd expect it to be. He wasn't even trying to go to hell in the first place. He just dreamt that some soul policemen were trying to collect his soul without realizing that he'd gained immortality, so he got pissed and took matters into his own hands. At this point in the story, even the Ten Kings of Hell had heard about the Monkey King's power, so they were pretty much helpless to stop him from not only crossing off his name, but also the names of every other monkey on Earth. He's not so generous in the movie, though. After a short battle with Yama, the King of Hell, he crosses out his own name and dips out shortly thereafter. But not before King Yama can file his own official complaint with the Jade Emperor, which also happens in the original story. Sidebar, I love that in Chinese mythology, the heavens function just like a government. Other pantheons have kings and queens, obviously, maybe a court and some judges, but that's usually where the parallels to government ends, while well, the Chinese heavens have bureaus, officers, official complaint forms, and paperwork. Now at this point in the story, Sun Wukong's ego has swollen so large that it's scraping the heavens. So he's almost caught up to Kanye, and he decides that he deserves an official position in the heavenly government, a demand we're expecting to hear from Ye any day now. He goes right up to the Jade Emperor and tells him as much, but here's the problem. Sun Wukong doesn't actually know how the government functions. This allows the Jade Emperor to appease him by assigning him the lowest ranked station in all of heaven, Stable Boy. Now to Sun Wukong's credit, he crushes his new role, but as soon as he learns how low he is on the hierarchy, he abandons his post and returns to the Monkey Kingdom on Earth, which irritates the powers in heaven. So much so that the Jade Emperor dispatches an entire army to arrest Sun Wukong. But after the monkey dueled Prince Nuja and nearly split his arm in two with a whack from his staff, the gods realized arresting him might cause more trouble than it's worth. Instead, they sought to appease him by offering a new title, Great Sage Equal to Heaven. If accepted, he'd be given a new permanent residence, a mansion that resided right next to the orchard where the peaches of immortality grew, so he could stand guard over the orchard from the comfort of his own home. Only this doesn't go how the Jade Emperor and his advisors planned, because while the monkey happily accepts the esteemed position, he couldn't protect the peaches from the most dangerous threat of all. Sun Wukong took his duties as guard very seriously and protected those peaches against all outside threats, but those poor peaches never stood a chance against Sun Wukong. The Monkey King ate every single one of the peaches of immortality before he, once again, bailed out of heaven. Except this time, he made sure to crash the heavenly banquet that was going on before he left 
because he was bitter about not being invited. After stealing some of the god's wine of immortality and sharing it with all his monkey friends, it was time to fight off another celestial army. And this time, the fight didn't go so smoothly. For starters, the monkey army was easily defeated by the celestial warriors, forcing Sun Wukong to get involved and battle all four of the Buddha's great heavenly kings. But after defeating them, he has another fat fish to fry. And I'm not talking about the Buddha. Yet. No, the Jade Emperor sends his nephew Erlang to quell the Monkey King's rebellion, and Sun Wukong finally meets his match. The Monkey King puts up a hell of a fight, transforming into all kinds of shapes, from birds to bugs to full-blown temples, but the problem is Erlang has many of the same abilities, so he manages to restrain Monkey and deliver him to heaven. If you've played the game, you'll remember that Erlang makes an appearance in the intro, where he has another duel with Sun Wukong and says this. None other than me can challenge him to a duel. This is an obvious reference to the battle we just discussed, and is one of the few that Sun Wukong has ever lost, which might be why Erlang says that only he is able to duel the monkey. Back to the story, after Sun Wukong's arrest, the gods try every trick in the book to execute him, attempting numerous times to chop off his head with a variety of bladed weapons, but he's just become too immortal. After learning the way from Subodhi, crossing his name off the life and death registry, and downing an entire orchard's worth of peaches, nothing seems to work. Their Hail Mary attempt involved slow roasting the monkey in an oven for more than 40 days, with the hope that this would cause the immortality juices flowing through him to seep out and evaporate. But the gods were horrified to see that burning him alive only made him stronger. This left them with no choice but to call for help from the one being who could rival his power, Buddha. Now this should sound pretty familiar to anyone who's seen the movie, because this is more or less how its finale unfolds. After stealing a potion of immortality from heaven and soundly defeating the Dragon King, Sun Wukong was out of control and had to be stopped by any means necessary. I'm not talking about with brute force though. The Buddha knew that the easiest way to defeat the Monkey King wouldn't be to outmatch his strength, but to exploit his arrogance. When Buddha confronts Monkey King, and Monkey King demands he be given the Jade Emperor's position as the ruler of the heavens, Buddha makes a deal with him. If Sun Wukong can cloud Somersault out of his right hand in a single leap, then the position would be his. If not, he would have to remain in the world below and avoid going anywhere near heaven until he could prove he wouldn't try to take it over again. And there was no hesitation from Monkey before accepting the challenge. Monkey shrunk down to the appropriate size to fit on the Buddha's hand and proceeded to jump higher than he ever had. Then, when he reached the very edge of the universe, he signed his name to serve as proof, and even left a puddle of piss just to rub it in. But you can imagine Monkey's surprise when he boasts about his accomplishment to Buddha, only to have the rug ripped out from underneath him. The Buddha presented his hand to the monkey and revealed the truth behind the illusion. The spot where Monkey had written his name and urinated was only halfway up Buddha's middle finger. As punishment for losing the bet, Monkey was sentenced to imprisonment under a mountain for 500 years, five whole centuries of being frozen in place with barely any room to move or stretch his legs. During that time, no one was allowed to speak with him, and the only food he could eat was iron pellets, which you can also find in Black Myth Wukong. But it was his adventures after the 500-year imprisonment that had the most inspiration on the game's plot. But we'll talk all about that in part two. As for Netflix's Monkey King, I'll risk repeating myself and say I was genuinely impressed at how it incorporated the source material, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that, so leave a comment down below. And while you're at it, you better like and subscribe so you don't miss part two of this little series where I dive even deeper into the Monkey King's messed up origins. I'll see you again next Thursday. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Thank you.